Um, today we kick off the last six weeks of our study and we're talking about the 12 minor prophets. So I want to take a few minutes today to talk about them and about what we're going to be doing for the next six weeks. So we talk about the 12 minor prophets. This is the eighth and really the last book in the second section of the Hebrew Bible. And that's important when you understand the value of the Hebrew Bible. But it is, just as this name applies, 12 minor prophets, it is 12 separate books. It's not considered the 12 minor prophets book. So that's important to understand. It was also written by 12 different authors, um, though a few commentaries have a few... Uh, discussions about some different input. But when we talk about minor and the 12 minor prophets, it has nothing to do with the value of these books any more than any other piece of scripture that is God-breathed. It is simply the, the, the length of the books. I mean, we look at the book of Obadiah, that's only one chapter. We look at Hosea and Zechariah and we see up to 14 chapters, but still significantly less than some of the larger books like the book of Isaiah. So that is only the reason they're referred to as minor. And they're gathered together at the end of the Bible, but they range from a very broad spectrum of time. The books of Hosea and Amos, both of them date to about the middle of the 8th century BCE. Or if you looked at the book of Zechariah and Malachi, they're going to see somewhere in their studies some of the big discussions about the beginning of the 4th century BCE. So quite a wide range. The important things about the 12 minor prophets is their overall theme. And that is Israel's relationship with God. And as I was going through some of these studies, here's my mindset I'll just share with you. If I'm to get the most out of this, this 12 books of the Bible are talking about Israel's relationship with God. And if I put myself as a follower of Christ in that role of Israel, it's much easier to apply what we're learning here. So I encourage you to do the same because just the things that Israel did, I mean, maybe we didn't worship a wooden idol, but we worship idols in our life today. And maybe we didn't do some of the evil things that Israel have done, but we have sinned in our own accord. So I think if we can put ourselves in that mind place, you will get so much more out of the teachings of these books. Some of the questions that we ask in biblical prophecy, you know, how does God, what does he really demand of us as humans? I mean, he knows our limitations as humans, so what is he really demanding of us? What is he really demanding of the people of Israel? And how do some of the historical events that we're going to talk about through these books, what do they really signify about God's word? I mean, there's a lot of different questions that come up when we talk about biblical prophecy. But what we're learning is that in these 12 minor prophets, there is more discussion about these, these questions than in any other book. So there is so much to learn in this little piece. And we've talked about it before. Some of us have hardly explored these 12 books, right? I mean, you might have read through, you might have grabbed a verse here and there, but have you actually done a study of Obadiah? Raise your hand. <laughs> no. So I think it's so interesting for us to be able to spend this time on here and to get as much as we can from that. But that le leaves a problem because what we're doing in this series, we're cramming two books into every week. And that's, even though the study is rich and this group that you're going to be talking through this study is rich, it's still a lot of information. So what we've decided to do is we're actually going to do, go through Tim Mackey's he has done video clips, his drawings, audio, on each of the minor prophets. So we're going to be looking at them as part of our lecture time. And I want to talk real briefly with you about your handout and what you can see here. Um, on the left side, you'll see some of the milestones. These are some of the things that you'll see in the video clips. For instance, in Hosea, you're, we're going to be talking about idolatrous Israel, the adulterous Gomer and adulterers redeemed, how God cries out and almost redeemed, kind of the milestones you'll see in the video clip. And next on that, you'll see this layout that breaks down the, the book itself into different sections, different timing. It talks about the theme. That came from an overview that's been done by Charles Swindoll that we're going to follow a lot. But with our limited 20, 25 minutes that we have, we're not going to be covering as much as I want to share with you. So I have put on the back some of the highlights I got from Charles Swindoll's overview, which I found very applicable. And, you know, why is Hosea, why is this so important, this book? And what's the big idea about this particular book? But more importantly, how do I apply this now? 
and I hope you'll take the time to review it. If we get a chance to highlight a few things, we will, but with the essence of time, I want to make sure that we get as much as we can out of this. Sound good? And you'll have one of these for each week, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and look at Hosea here. And I am got to remember to look back. <laughs> There we go. We're going to talk about the two. Okay, the book of Hosea. I want to take a moment and talk about the, the logo that we've been following through this series. And this one, if you can look at it, in our book, Hosea marries a prostitute who leaves him. Then God tells him to go get her and bring her back. So we see the arrows back and forth. And it's kind of a metaphor of how God is remaining faithful to northern Israel, even though they haven't been faithful to him. You see that God is faithful there. So the theme of Hosea is this, God's faithful love toward his very unfaithful people. Keep that in mind as we watch the video. And let's go ahead and go to the video clip. Um, just in here you'll see Hosea accuses Israel of breaking their covenant with God and he warns them of the tragic consequences to follow. So let's watch. So I'm really glad you're there. So we're going to move on to Joel. But before we do, here's the thing I've tried to push, and we've tried to push throughout the series. Where is Christ in the Old Testament? So let's take a moment and look here. And you can see at the bottom of your chart, Christ, being called, Christ is being called out from hiding in Egypt as a child is pictured in Hosea's record of Israel's exodus from Egypt. See, 11.1. 1. See also Matthew 2.15. But in Hosea's redemption of Gomer from the slave market, Christ is pictured as the loving, faithful redeemer of sinful humanity. So right. Okay, let's move to Joel and let's see his logo. Um, okay, the logo is pretty much basic. We know that Joel is about the locust that comes, so that pretty makes sense. He explains the recent plague of locusts is judgment from God, and he calls on Judah to repent. So now we are moving into southern Israel. So Tim Mackey says, Joel reflects on the day of the Lord and how true repentance will bring about the great restoration hoped for in the other prophetic books. Some of the milestones we're going to watch is the locust swarm right away, and the day of the Lord, understanding the significance of the day of the Lord. Faithful, restored, God's spirit on all, and a new Edom. And the book of Joel accounts for justice over evil in a form that's unique to other Old Testament prophets. Unlike the other books, Joel tells a story about this terrible plague of locusts that seems to traverse across time. Let's see what that means. Okay, so we take a quick look at the book of Joel and we want to focus down on the, what Christ is in Joel and we see the coming of the Holy Spirit who applies Christ's redemption is predicted in chapters 2 verses 28 and we see Jesus Christ is the one who judges nation and he also restores the people. A reminder. Okay, we have just a couple minutes here. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight is on the back on while Joel is so important, that second pair it talks about the day of the Lord. And I want to focus a little bit on this. Second paragraph or second line at the end says Joel's book gives some of the most striking and specific details in all of Scripture about the day of the Lord and what that really means to us. Days cloaked in darkness, where ar armies that could occur like consuming fire and the moon turning to blood. I mean, it's hard for us to visually understand what that day would like. When we think of locusts, we think of a gr big grasshopper. But when you read in here, and one of the references that I read was in Revelations chapter 9, verses 8. And the pictures up here depicted those locusts and what they represented were not a simple grasshopper. They represented an evil that is just unknown to us. So take a little time to spend with that. I hope you will. And I hope you've enjoyed this day. Have a great time in your group. Let's go ahead and close in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to explore your word in these small bits and pieces over the next few weeks. Heavenly Father, you are showing us a picture of the people of Israel and how they allowed sin to come into their life and turned away from you, Father, and what that meant for them and what that meant for you, Father, how it broke your heart, how it emotionally tore you apart, Father, and we are just so 
thankful that you are a redeeming God, Lord, that you saw in sight, you see us, you see those people of Israel, that you saw something in them that we cannot see in ourselves, Lord, and your heart was open for redemption. We are so blessed, Lord. Help us to seek our own sins, our own adversaries and things that keep us from you, Father, and to identify them and be redeemed. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.